Welcome everyone to episode eight of Spin the Wheel and sadly the season finale of the first season of Spin the Wheel. I'm your host, Chuck Ghost, Senior Strategic Advisor at Social Chorus, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Rachel Miller. How are you doing today, Rachel? I'm good, Chuck. Thank you. Eight weeks. Can you believe we've been doing this for eight weeks? It's flown by. It's been fun. It has been a lot of fun, and we began this. We did it. We did a trial episode early, a little bit of a sneak peek for everyone. And on that episode, we talked about how long we've known each other, and had not really had a chance to do much work together. Uh, and so it has been a, a fun couple months. And people have already asked us what's season two look like, what's happening next. We don't know. We'll be very honest about that. Nice. <laughs> uh, but we will come up with something that's for sure because this has been been way too fun. Um, as those that have watched in the past, or you're, you're joining us now, uh, for the past seven weeks, we have been spinning the wheel on internal comms topics. And then Rachel and I have been addressing the ideas that you have brought to us. But for the last episode, we thought we would pick the topics and then spin the wheel throughout the show. Uh, these are not your normal topics. These are, I believe Rachel, you use the term bugbears to perhaps describe mm -hmm. some of these. Um, I yeah. use grievances. So uh, one of the, part of our planning here, to educate Rachel a little bit on Festivus, which is a holiday that mm -hmm. I celebrate yeah, every year. Thing. Every year, December 23rd, uh, originated from the show Seinfeld and Frank Costanza, who created this holiday. Uh, and part of that holiday is you have a feats of strength, but unfortunately, Rachel, I'm not, we're not in the same room, so we can't try to pin each other um, during this time. But yep. we can do an airing of grievances, which is where we talk about all the ways that people in your life have disappointed you over the last year. Now, we're not going to be calling out any names. I mean, that's at least I'm not. No. I'm not going to be calling anybody out. I'm, I'm, but, I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> but, but we thought this would be a, a, a fun way to do it. In the chat, I have added on LinkedIn a link that if somebody is, is courageous enough or confident enough and they want to join the show, an air agreement. You've got the link in LinkedIn, and and can do that. Come and join uh, before, us. Come and be brave. Please do. So uh, before we get into uh, the show, I did want to pass along here. Amy loves your Thanks. rainbow top there. Uh, Thank you very much. Becky made it to the final Becky one. The last the last show as well. Hi, Becky. So I got a bit of sequins as well as it's the final show. I was trying to persuade Chuck to wear an evening gown, a full on evening frock, but he wasn't playing ball. I, well, I, I'm happy to. I have no shame for one, Rachel. <laughs> season two. Our, okay, there's, there's our, the promise right there. That there's is. Season two, Chuck. I heard I'll it. Have, <laughs> I'll have to go to Goodwill to see what I can find that might fit my frame. Because uh, my wife, Kristen, who is also our executive producer, who is celebrating Canada Day, so all of our Canadians out there, our house is decorated in all kinds of Canada stuff. Uh, you put it all in there. So there. We, Good work. We, we have. Um, she's celebrating Canada Day, so she's off today. So I'm executive producer slash co-host as we get through this. Um, but we've got Dan. Thank you, Dan, for joining. Hey, Dan. Great to see you there. Um, Erica is not saying hello to us, but obviously to <laughs> Dan. But no, Erica, you know, she's been a, been a part of the show for or attending, I think maybe every show. We should have taken attendance on this to maybe see who's yeah. attended every single one. And because it is eight o'clock where you are, Rachel, we mm -hmm. we did come prepared for we this. Did. So okay. cheers. This is in a quarantini glass. Cheers. Um some might point out that it's three o'clock where I live. Yeah, it's not eight o'clock where you are, Chuck. <laughs> it's Just not, but it is eight o'clock where you live, Rachel. So I figured I should uh, join in on that. Thanks, Take Absolutely. him off the team there. Good on you. I am. I am. I'm ready to go. All right. Let's get this set up. And again, everybody can uh, go find the link on LinkedIn in the chat. Uh, if you want to join in, let's bring up the topics here. Let's bring in our wheel, magical mystery wheel. Uh, there's our spin the wheel and Festivus as we bring in our airing of grievances to make this all happen. And these are our grievances that we have for everyone. We'll explain what these are if the wheel chooses them. So we've got quick yeah. questions, kind of garbage words, imposter syndrome, fake HR, and other conversations, seat at the table, survey fatigue, 
how did it land? And that last one that's being hidden is logo-itis on there. Hidden by a logo. Love it. Yep. So we right. That's a that's a good point. Good call on on that. Uh, so these are the topics that we have. Again, people are welcome to join in and hit the link. Come in with your own grievance. Last week it started on four, so I'm going to get the wheel to four. Mm -hmm. Give it a good spin. Number two. Okay, so we're going to talk about kind of and garbage words. So, and this is one that uh, I brought in. And it's something, Rachel, yeah. it's, dri it's, it's driving me crazy. And Tell I, me, see, what, what, what's I going see people on? at all levels using this phrase, kind of. And it's so weak. And I use it, we use it as transition phrases. One of the words, and I mentioned this when we were talking about this, this grievance of mine, is the word so. I've had to train myself, and I'm still training myself not to use the word so as this transition and it's it's a garbage word it doesn't add any value to a conversation you use it as a bridge you I use do. it as a thinking and I, space and i'm a thinking space that's a positive way to put it rachel uh but kind of here's an example rachel we're going to kind of go through some kind of grievances that kind of drive me a little kind of crazy <laughs> and, so I we are, we are. <laughs> and i hear this and i'm thinking does nobody else hear us use these words in this way and it's not just kind of it's the word just that i threw in there just is and a like. weak word and like yep. like was one of yours my kids do this yeah i i, I do this is this so to be, to be clear are we is it irritating because we are professional communicators and we hear ourselves getting in our own way by using garbage words or is it generally i see it as both because to me it weakens a conversation it weakens your point it's like mm -hmm. we're either alike it's like this we're we're softening our approach we're not coming at it strong we're like well can we kind of do this then let's kind of do that and i don't know i i, I don't yeah. i don't like it so we're we we've got some votes for for a lot of them uh coming in um Dan, younger generation. So I don't, Rachel, maybe you're not part of the younger generation using, using. How like dare you? <laughs> <laughs> My children use like a lot. So it, it, <laughs> it's very common. It's very, very common. Uh, There's some great words coming in here. Rachel, Thank you for comments. I, my colleague oh. at Social Care, utilize. Yeah, use is a great word. We don't need to utilize yes, anything. We can just use it. In addition uh, is one of mine as well. When people start a sentence with in addition, no, 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 you don't need to write in addition ever. And, and Zane, who I know does a lot of, of multimedia work, he does a podcast, does videos. Yes, it's great starts. And I, and I, Zane, I hear myself doing that on my own podcast and I cringe when I hear it. I try to even edit it out, I will admit, because it's so uh, do by you? nature. Ooh. I do. But even today, I'm, I'm doing my best not to say that because I've, I think we can all be stronger in our language. I think that's that's the approach. We can be more direct more convincing if we're not backing off and and suggesting what we should do no we know we know what mm -hmm. what we need what we need to do out there people are jumping in and telling us where they're tuning in from which is great so i saw greg tuning in from la and greg's joined yep. us most weeks so hi greg we've never actually called you out so final show of season one welcome thank you for joining us each week i think greg's been one of our friends of the show yep. so thank you greg and we've got uh dan <laughs> you know, fancy dress for everyone. Dan, I'm I'm on board. Let's let's, Why not? let's make this let's make this happen out here. Um <laughs> all right. So let's let's move along from this mm -hmm. one and bring this is really testing my uh control yeah. skills here. Okay, so we were at kind Good of job. we won't repeat any of these. We won't repeat any of these. So we'll spin the wheel again if we have to. Number one, quick questions. I, <laughs> this is say, you. This is your rant. I say, I apologize in advance for my social course colleagues who have heard this rant time and time again. And I want, maybe this is an advice for those that are doing more virtual meetings and Zoom calls that I hear, there's no such thing, Rachel, anymore as people just having a question. No, they have quick questions. 
Well, mm -hmm. and are they quick though? That's the thing. Not. Are they quick questions? They're not. They're never quick, are they? <laughs> no. And and if 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 Sonia Firenze is watching now, I think she's probably cringing because she's heard this this rant of mine so many times. That the problem with that is it implies that it's a quick answer. Mm, not mm. the case. It's either a question. It's a simple question. It's a complex question. But I hear quick question when people really all they have is a question. But they're like, again, it's weak. It's like I, I just have a, I just have kind of a quick question out there. It's it's that it's <laughs> you that did weak. like and kind of. I did it. I did that on purpose. <laughs> you did. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, listening. I'm listening. <laughs> that, it's that it's that weakening. No, we have a question. We might have a simple question. Mm. We might have a complex question. Uh, Here's a, what is this one from Dan? Yes, I started getting emails. And DM starting with quick questions. Oh, yes. no. We've even Choo -choo. turned into an acronym. That's when we know no. it's gotten out of control. That's when we know it's gotten out of control. Thank you, Dan, for that. That's from uh, John Whedon. So, John, just a bit further, I'm pointing. Uh, a bit further up the comments that came in from John Whedon. Thank you, John. I've not seen that. I've not seen QQ. If someone sent me that, I would have to Google it. I wouldn't know what that meant. I, I do now. As oh, much that's of a even rant. Worse. Oh. I, I feel so much Ooh. better about this rant now, Rachel. I feel like I'm at the like <laughs> tipping point of the, 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 like the cutting edge of this of this of this rant because other I didn't even know QQ is a thing that people have. No, we just have no. just have questions out there. Oh, I feel I'm better out here. Oh, good. <laughs> Although John, he, oh, he's teaching us, but calling that out. Thank it. you for your honesty, uh, John. That's very honest. And then, and then, Rachel, it's all—it is very dismissive. Like, I don't mm. want—I don't—I don't want you to give me the full answer. Just give me like the the just the tiny bit that I need in there. Mm. So, all right. I get that I, as a consultant, where people ask me, "Can I just ask you a quick question?" So, I've actually got a fifteen-minute free call on my website because I had so many quick questions, and particularly when you're a consultant, time is money. And and you're right; it's never quick. It's never quick. And if it's you've got a quick. quick question, then we can have a quick 15 minute conversation. But if in the quick 15 minute conversation, there's a load more questions, it's definitely not quick. <laughs> and it, I've, had some, I, I I've had some 15 minute conversations, Rachel, that do not feel very quick either. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's beside the point. I hear you. All right. I think we've done <laughs> enough on that one. I'm feeling better. I've got, I got two of mine. Good. Um, right, right off the, right off the bat here to spin the wheel on. And Becky Rand now almost feeling apologetic, asking that she has a really QQ for us. So anyway, all right, here we go. Back to the wheel. <laughs> well, we're not doing two again. We already we already done that one. Number six. Oh, Rachel, this oh. is going to be a good one. This is going to be a good one. Joke. Survey <laughs> fatigue. You know what? I'm going to let you go first on this one, Rachel. So this is a conversation Chuck and I have had numerous times over the years. So there is this I'm just mindset. Enjoy my beverage. That, yeah, go for it. <laughs> There's this mindset around survey fatigue in organizations and that you can over survey people and people get really tired of surveys. And very often they're tired of rubbish surveys. If you're encouraging people to have their have their say and you know give them a voice, if you're having a decent survey with decent questions, then people will make the time to answer it. Part of our role, I think, is to understand what are the different surveys going on in an organization. Because probably if people are feeling survey fatigued or if you're being told that people are feeling survey fatigued, it's probably because there's surveys that you're not aware of where your people are being asked their, for their views all the time. So to get ahead of that, you need to know your organization and know what's going on. And when that pushback comes in terms of people are feeling you know, survey fatigued, you need to understand why how many surveys have gone on. So that's, that's my view is that ideally you have planned surveys and you manage expectations and you know when they are. When they are. Um, but I'm curious about your, your view, Chuck. I'm gonna bring this comment in from Laura because it's so well-placed, Laura. Thank you for teeing this up. <laughs> so true. It's such, it is such- I'm having a drink for this. Of mine. Thank you, yeah, <laughs> please do. I'm gonna like, crack my knuckles on this one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, here, here's it. One, it doesn't exist. It's basically <laughs> this boogeyman of surveys that we have out there, 
where we have even if surveys, I love that. We have shifted the blame of bad surveys off to our employees. We have said we can't do any more surveys because they've got survey fatigue. Well, if they're tired of anything, it's of taking really bad surveys. So we've shifted the blame from us, the ones that are often the ones creating them, not totally responsible, but it should fall on us a bit, that we've shifted the blame to our employees, that it's more their problem, their fatigue. It's not that we are creating really bad surveys out there because what we see time and time again is when you ask people for feedback and they give their feedback and then you say, this is what you told us. And then we deliver on that and you go back and ask again, people are more than happy to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here we go, Zane. If it's listened to and acted upon, they're happy to do it. So if they are fatigued, it's that they're tired of dealing with us in the process. It's not the surveys. That's where we've shifted Mm -hmm. the blame. And I see it's become this term that people use that I don't even know if they've even talked to their employees about it. Maybe we're the ones that are fatigued. Maybe we're the ones tired of the process on it. But instead, we are shifting the blame to other people. So um, yeah, after students get missed, that's why I don't know what to do with them. There, there's all yeah, it should be you said so we did or you said so we're doing and very often it's not and we you have to shoehorn employee survey rolls around if there's an annual one and you're looking for the evidence where's the you said so we've done and if there if you don't have any evidence and you haven't taken the feedback seriously and acted on it then yeah funnily enough people aren't going to want to fill in your survey no matter how pretty it looks or what your you know win an ipad a day or whatever we're doing um people are tired of that they are tired of that and and this one from from laura i'm going to bring her in there they are tired of taking surveys with with no action so again that is Mm -hmm. that's on us for whole either us accountable our leadership accountable for it and i compare it to even in the consumer world every single flight and pre-covid i was a pretty pretty solid frequent flyer out there loyal Mm -hmm. delta customer love flying with delta I would get a survey after every flight to fill out, asking the same questions. No one's, nothing's gonna happen. No one's gonna change anything based on my, my, if I have explicit feedback around them, I will find a way to give it. Mm-hmm. But that, just that constant survey that I know nothing's but gonna happen. Were they generic? Were they too generic? Absolutely. What was, Absolutely. What was the problem with them? Okay. Yeah. And, and so it, it's not ask for, a lot of times I would ask for details that if I had known prior, like, tell us what you think of this, I would have taken notes mm-hmm. around it. But afterwards, like, I don't, I don't remember people's names. I didn't think to you get that. You definitely would have taken name. notes as well, bless you. I would have. You would have done that have. as well. <laughs> you yes. would. And you've done, you done a good, a good survey. Bless and you. I think that Dan here just jumped a shark with a <laughs> short QQ survey. Well done. Well done. Love it. Yeah, on that one. <laughs> Why not? All right. Yeah. Survey fatigue. It'll probably be a constant debate, but maybe we can yeah. avoid it by creating great surveys, doing something with feedback. I think Laura's point there is a good one. We have to write good surveys, keep them short Absolutely. and sweet, limited to one topic. Love that. It, it is about the quality of the survey. If you have a quality survey where you're genuinely interested in people's views, you do something with it. It's not a tick box exercise you're amplifying employee voice, then hopefully people won't get tired of doing it and we won't get tired of doing it either. And here's a, uh, we always have an anonymous user. Maybe this is Alyssa again. Is this Alyssa, Alyssa maybe? Yeah. The, uh, the focus group fatigue. I would love for an employee yeah. to have focus group fatigue because that would that's where you get the good feedback. Like I would love for an employee to say, stop, I don't want to be a part of any more focus groups. Um, See, I find whenever I talk to clients and I'm, we're going to do focus groups and they say, oh, I know just who to invite. I'm like, mm. hold on a second. <laughs> Let me tell you my criteria. I don't just want your noisy people and, and the positive right. pennies. You know, positive pennies are great, but I need your negative Nigels as well. I need everybody. I need to hear everybody's voice. But what we do, you Posit- do normally positive pennies positive and negative penny, Nigels. Negative Nigels, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's really Those important you have that mix. Because it if is. not, if you've just got a room full of, you know, people nodding and agreeing with what you're saying and everything's jolly and fine, you wouldn't be doing a focus group. You wouldn't be trying to get that qualitative feedback from people. 
Yeah, much much to the chagrin of some of my colleagues, Rachel, I, I tend to be known maybe as a negative Nigel. I, I like taking that contrarian view from time to time. So I'm, I'm shocked by view. that, Chuck. <laughs> okay, let's bring up Let me spin. our content and wheel again. We've covered three okay. of them. We these shows go thirty minutes. Everybody knows we're not we're not stopping at thirty minutes. We're gonna keep going till we till we're till we have spin the wheel. <laughs> we've rented, so we've rented all night. Number three, imposter syndrome. See, I'm curious why that's on there. I want I want to know what what your rant is on imposter syndrome. How 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 complex do we want to get here on this? It's not going to be quick. Well, <laughs> well, I I I know what I know what your what your view is. And it's the opposite to mine. It is. So I'll, I'll go first on this one then. It is a, we have manifested, uh, I think, moments where we have a little bit of lack of confidence and we've turned it into this syndrome. We've turned it into this big, scary thing that everybody experiences. And we've given it this name, like imposter. Nobody wants to be labeled an imposter. Even that is a, a negative. You and I mm -hmm. at the event in Birmingham this past October, uh, mm -hmm. the CIPR yeah, Insight right. event, yeah. we both talked about imposter syndrome mm -hmm. from different angles because what I have learned in when everybody started talking about this, everybody has moments of lack of confidence out there. Mm -hmm. I think imposter syndrome takes it too far. That what I've learned is that it's not a syndrome, it's a cognitive bias. It's the way our brains work. And that bias is called the less than average effect. That's all it is, less than average. It's not an imposter. Somebody that's less than average is not an imposter out there. I'm going to say imposter so many times in a, in a weird way to get make it sound weird. I'm adding that to the but, wheel separately. Don't <laughs> saying it like that. It's, say it nicely. It's, 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 it's scaring people. And it gets this collective group where... Uh, it, it brings people together almost like this misery loves company where I would rather look at ways that how can we build confidence and know that th there are going to be times where you don't feel like you're, that maybe you quite belong or you fit or you're punching above your weight terminology. I think that's sometimes where people use this imposter syndrome. Like, oh, I shouldn't be there. And it's, it's almost in a humble brag kind of way at times where they want to talk about this amazing accomplishment, but oh, I don't feel like I'm worthy because I have imposter syndrome and they cower I couldn't down. disagree with you more. <laughs> I couldn't disagree with you more. I'm seriously. And so I'm seriously I will pass it on to it. you, Rachel. I will pass it over to you. So, I'm just, I'm, so when I when I spoke at the CIPR Inside um, conference in October, it was a very honest presentation and was sharing how I, I've had imposter syndrome. I, I still occasionally now have it, but the the useful thing for me was having a definition and having and particularly from reading Claire Josta's book um her surname J-O-S-A a really really interesting book around imposter syndrome which came out last year and it was putting a name to the feelings and it was putting a name to the she talks in the book about you know it's not um self-doubt in a spiky suit and and has some really clear definitions of what is imposter syndrome and what isn't and for me it was very useful to read a book where I identified with it and thought I have felt that I have felt I don't know anyone who is confident the whole time who doesn't feel like they're a fraud in certain situations I think it's the key bit for me in imposter syndrome is recognizing where you're at and coming up with coping strategies to be confident in the skin you're in be confident in the role that you're in to be able to live your life in the way that you want to live it without this negativity and these voices going you really shouldn't be here it's complete fluke you're going to get found out which I think is really human, actually. And I think it's really, even without having a, a name, I think if you feel that, and the reason I shared that story uh, was around, it's important to me to be honest in my work and it's important to be upfront. And it isn't around misery loves company. It's just, if you feel these things, you are human. And if you feel these emotions, but you understand how to get over them and don't let them become barriers and get in your way, then that's what good looks like. That's, I encourage you to do that. So I really disagree with you, Chuck. We, well, you see, are this my is, work husband, this is as where, you know, but I disagree with you. <laughs> this is where we this is where we do agree, though. All of those things you just described, I'm a hundred percent on board. I think it's the labels that we've used. 
it's this syndrome. It feels like it's this thing that just layers this dark cloud. If we remove syndrome, if we just said feeling of being an imposter, how would that feel? Hundred percent. I'm good. I'm on board. So it's the syndrome. That's interesting. It's, so it's, it's a syndrome it's bit. Syndrome. It's this feeling that it's it's this thing that holds us down forever. No, there's always the moments where we all feel. Should we be in this place? Are we qualified to talk about this? There, there, does that is that an imposture or is that lack? I don't know. It's it's that syndrome. It's this thing that we're never going to get out of it. It's it's a dark, cold winter weighing us down. It's not what it is. It's moments. It's, oh, just, it's these little bits of time <laughs> out there. Anyway, so I'm going to look at these. We've tech. got lots of great. <laughs> got a rant about the rent. We've got some great comments that have, that have come in. Let's see here. Uh, what is this about rate about a is the BS that gets you through? I'm good with that. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting and different views. I attended an event today on imposter syndrome. Hopefully, Dan, you do not feel like an imposter attending an event on the imposter syndrome. But I think that's it. We've marketed this term. We've oh, turned yeah. it into this thing. Oh, so we I think I it. think it's, it's always a, been it's a thing. It's, it's always been a thing, but now it has. It's the label bit that that really isn't isn't floating your boat. I think, isn't it? It's the it's the label, it but it, you need to identify it to call it out and then work on it. So we're not going to agree on this. We now here's an interesting thought it. from from Zane. I keep calling up Zane because we're making some good points in the chat. Others, I'll, I'll pull up others. That feeling like imposter is actually what makes us good communicators and humans. Zane, join the great join point. it. The links in the chat. Come find us in here. I'd love to have you. Uh, love to have you join to. To talk about that, uh, let's see what what Kim here. Kim has joined many times over the past week. Hi, we don't Kim. feel like we're imposters. We're not pushing ourselves to try things. Uh, well, that's I, I see where we're going with that. I see where we're going with that. I, I like that Kim because then it's we we should all push ourselves. It's not about the point of discomfort and being uncomfortable. But I think if you do want to excel, maybe that's why nobody's joining this. They're worried they're. they're we're going to try something new. We didn't know what it was going to be like to go live. Now we do it without really much yeah. talking about it. Um, but but I maybe, love it when maybe the pushing bit there. Push to try things. I think maybe the pushing bit is not always about pushing. It's about gently nudging. Sometimes we're not ready for a shove or a push. Maybe it's baby steps and to you know find our way incrementally. So I think there's, there's, a, there's a middle ground there, there for me, I think. Yep. And yeah, I, I, I feel like well, we're not pushing good. ourselves. That, that is how you grow is by stretching okay i think we've done enough on on that one though i could i could go on forever. you could keep going yeah. all right here we go <laughs> we had six survey fatigue we don't need to do that again six well I it's really like in the survey fatigue well one this is getting painful seven how did it land oh. so oh, sorry i didn't bring in the wheel that time sorry bad producers a bit there we landed <laughs> on number seven so how did it land that was one of yours to add to the list, Rachel. So I blogged about this recently. I'm going to take a sip. I don't like, <laughs> take a sip. I don't like how did it land? Because if I'm working with someone and that we're talking about, you know, doing a campaign and, and they're talking about, you know, how is this going to land with employees and how did it land? I would love to think that they're talking about, does it make sense? Does it resonate? What do people understand? But normally they mean we need to land this means we just need to push it out. We need to push mm. out something. We need to land this with our employees. And that just sets my teeth on edge because I don't want to hear that we need to land this. Unless you really genuinely mean we need to check for understanding, do people understand what we, they need to do as a result of whatever we're trying to communicate, then I'm okay with it. But nine times out of 10, probably more, 10 times out of 10, we need to land this. And it's a narrative that we've just got in this cycle of, and I, I just detest it because it doesn't go far enough to articulate our role as professional communicators. And then our stakeholders pick up on it and they talk about to the comms team, we need to land this. And literally it often means we need to shove out an email and that's not okay. So whenever I hear we need, we need to land it or how did it land? How did it land is normally do people open the email rather than that digging deep check for understanding mm -hmm. everything I've just mentioned. So that's it, in a nutshell for me, if you say we need to land this, what do you actually mean? And do your stakeholders know what you actually mean? And if they don't, don't use a phrase, use something else. I, I, I really want to hear like from, it. I want to hear from people in the chat on this one, because I think this might be a British slash 
European slash not North America. Oh, do you have an equivalent? Well, I think what, what you said at the beginning, which is what it should mean. How did it resonate? Did people understand it? Did it make sense to them? Did they responded to it? The first time I heard the how did it land was one of your rants about it. Was it? <laughs> so I wonder <laughs> if, known really, about if, it. <laughs> if that's really a mm. Britishism. Is it more of a European statement? I, I, I have not had a, a client or heard a communicator use that before because Ooh, it is more about the resonating or response yeah. to it, not just yeah. the execution of getting it out. So if I, maybe maybe I'm um, do it. Uh, Dan Dan's active today. I'm glad you joined Dan. That once said to manager, I didn't know I was flying a plane <laughs> with everything before I said it. Look, they were fine. Well, job security a little bit on that one, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that's interesting that that is a a common term out there for it. And you see it a lot once you're aware of it. You see it everywhere and I, I see in conversations online and on twitter when people were discussing internal comms how did it land we need to land this i see it all the time and unless you really have that depth behind it if you're really talking about did it resonate did it make sense great but oh, more often than not it's not because how did it land oh. make it go viral like the same <laughs> same kind of much. like explanation out there um, or maybe yeah. it's people to ask a quick question about it. Rich, ask a quick question. About how... <laughs> kind of uh, ask it. Why, why not? Um, so <laughs> Laura, said, um, Laura said here, I have heard it, but I didn't think too much about it. So it is out there. Yeah. It is okay. There. We'll keep it over there. We, we need to, we need to, we need to, we it's not, in, need to it's not it. in South Africa either. So we've got a comment here saying new term, certainly never heard it here in South Africa. Oh, interesting. Yep. So don't start using it. If you haven't heard it before, no, put your mouth on. <laughs> um pretend oh here we go lisa i think it is a british term just moved from melbourne yeah. to london and now ask daily to land messages there we go See? there we go Everywhere. awesome thank you for that lisa that was awesome Hi, lisa. all right thank you. all right let's spin the wheel now i got the wheel Finish. up here Finish. oh no we did that one. Oh, you know what i think i've already i'm gonna pick oh there we go there's number eight logo itis which people can't see because of a logo which is awesome. <laughs> I love the irony. Um, <laughs> this this was also one of yours. Uh, oh. So, not everything needs a logo. A logo does not a successful campaign make. If you come to me and you need a logo because you think it makes your campaign more interesting, it doesn't. Um, it's a conversation I had, I spent 10 years in house, it's a constant conversation. Everything inside our organizations needs to align with what we're here to do, with our overall purpose, with our business objectives. Therefore, our company logo is the right one. You don't need a butchered version of you know, a word art, which is my absolute kryptonite, rainbow word art stretched to be a logo. <laughs> I'm, I'm out of there. If that, if that happens, I'm, I'm out of there. Um, everything should align with the business and what we're trying to achieve. Therefore, that's the logo you use, our company one. If it is a long-term project, if it is something which lives longer than just a one-off thing, then I may consider to a visual identity, which may or may not include a logo, but logo-itis is everywhere. I also blogged about, about that over at All Things I See. Um, oh gosh, it's just awful. And there's so many dreadful examples out there of awful logos do not a rubbish campaign make. You cannot pretty up a dreadful campaign and dreadful set of key messages by whacking a logo on it. It doesn't work. So I'm curious on this one. I want to know what people think on this one, whether they encounter this, whether there is logo itis. Is, this must be a global thing, surely. Can I confess to you something, Rachel? Is this Ooh, go on. in a safe space? You're across an ocean. So you're, you're in the US, I'm in the UK, so I can't Man, I love a, I love a good it. logo. I love oh, a good no, logo. No. Oh, I do. No. I love a good logo. I do. I love Why? a good logo. Why? I, don't, I love the visual nature of it. I, lo I like it when people think visually. No, I get it. if it's a one off message. OK, we don't need there, you don't need a logo for everything. But I do think no. there is a way that art can send a message and support a message. That's where I get mm -hmm. get behind it, even with the design of of the, the spin the wheel graphic that's now at the bottom of the screen that was blocking the local itis. I like a good logo. Gives me a good feel. It give, gives a good polish to communication out there. I wouldn't say it's a syndrome. Like an itis might be, which is more of a disease. <laughs> mm -hmm. But 
it it's I, I said I like a good logo out there. Let's see what what does Dane have to say. I felt you need a t-shirt with it on. I like a good logo. Yep. Graphic designs, so, so <laughs> the street, socially distant, of course. Okay. See our uh, newsletter doesn't fix a bad comp strategy. Yes. I would I would acknowledge that. I'm good with that. I'm not saying you need a logo yes, for everything. Need... I just like a really good logo. Or a newsletter. Like or a newsletter. Um, I would want to go back to the uh, the the did it land. This is generating some additional comments here. Um, you know, is it is it linked to this air traffic control aspect? Mm -hmm. There's been some other pilot uh, lingo in here, and, so, and then Amy even added this one about who said that communications are portal. Reminded this by the plane analogy: what you intend to communicate when you take off may not mean the same as where you land. Hmm, interesting way to view it as well. But again, that's check of understanding. Was our intended right. message received in the right way? Do people know what to do? So the 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 detail in there. Is that right mindset? So if people just kind of had a quick question about creating a logo out there, <laughs> or as Erica has here, how about graphic identifier? So, but people people try and get away with it by saying, I need I had this, I did I did an amnesty when I was in the railway, I did a logo amnesty. I joined, set up the function, and I was horrified by all the logos internally. So I did an amnesty and like send me everything. I need to see how bad this really is. And I gathered it all in one place and then used that to say, this is how bad it is. Look at all these different brands that we've got going on and identity and call it what you like. You know, people were calling it all sorts of, oh, it's not a logo, it's it's a visual mark. No, mm -hmm. definitely still a logo. <laughs> still a logo. <laughs> Don't try to get a, get a communicator. I think, no, I I think the next, you, you've inspired me, Rachel. I think the next thing I do, the next spin the wheel season, whatever that looks like, we're going to use a word art graphic. <laughs> I that... won't be here. There'll be an empty chair. <laughs> There'll be an empty chair. Chuck, it's over. No. Challenge. Honestly, it's my kryptonite. It's awful. Awful, awful. All right. Let's get to. Are we spinning? Uh, yes. Well, Great. let's see what we've got. We've got one we've covered. Let's just bump Fake along to number five. We've got, oh, let's let's do number five first. Let's do a seat at the okay. table. That's very mm -hmm. IC driven uh, that we see. It's, uh, if you did a, a word cloud of internal comms webinars and blog posts and complaints and rants and uh, events and conferences, you would probably see the phrase seat at the table somewhere in that in that word cloud. Uh, so go for it, Rachel. So seat at the table for me, for anyone who's not aware what this is, it's, it's a conversation that we have a lot around, do we have a seat at the table? Are we sitting around the right tables where decisions are made? Whether that's the boardroom or whether it's uh, for change communication, you know, if you've got a, a group of decision makers, are we there? And my answer always, there's, there's two things for me about seat at the table, is if we've done our job, it shouldn't matter whether we're sat at the board table or not. Every single person around that table needs to know their responsibility when it comes to communication. Internal comms, as you've heard me say many times, Chuck, it's too important to lift down to one team, one department, one person. It's everyone's responsibility. So if you're not in the room for whatever reason, it shouldn't really matter because those people in the room, particularly the boardroom, should understand their role when it comes to comms, which isn't a 10-minute update at the end and it gets locked off. Um, and my second thought on having a seat at the table is if you're not in the room, you grab a table, you grab the seats and you bring the people together. If you feel like you're not in a position to be able to bring a be part of the decision making process, then you set that, particularly for change. You bring those people together, bring your own, bring your own chairs, bring your own table and create that environment where you are there and you are present and you are having your voice heard. Really important. Just saying, oh, it's being done to me. No, no, no. Take control of this. If you genuinely are concerned about it, then do something. Vote with your feet. Do something and make it happen. I put this in the same category as survey fatigue, Rachel, where we have created this term to mm -hmm. provide an explain, like, to explain away what happened. Last year's PRSA Connect, my wife Kristen and I did a whole uh, presentation on complaining. We got all these complaints that we've heard from communicators over the years about why they can't do their job. And this is one of them that we heard, well, I don't mm -hmm. have a seat at the table. And 
even when we we pulled the audience and we we pulled a couple of people out, the people that said they don't have a seat at the table, what does that feel like? Then we find out people who did have a seat at the table or they felt like they did. What did that feel like? Turns out there was not much difference between the two. And and to to Dan's point again, Danny, right, frankly, co-hosting the show with us. It's all about relationships. It's not about it's not about yeah. a a seat. I joke with communicators that why do we define so much of what we do by furniture? We talk about a seat at the table. We talk about deskless workers. Like we need to get out of the furniture business and get into the relationship business. I'm gonna quote. I'm gonna turn that into. A I like that. You like that? I would have a t-shirt with that on. Yeah. There you go. But the, but the thing is, if if recent events have shown anything, no one is sitting around a table. We're all virtual at the moment, so there is no actual physical table. The thing I think about having a seat at the table is often pre-pandemic. The good stuff happens in the corridors, the conversations with your mm -hmm. stakeholders in the corridors when you're making your way to the boardroom or whatever room you're in, wherever this table is that you're having a seat at. That bit is, it is relationships. It's the relationship building in the corridor, sitting down before it starts. But uh, we can do that at any time. You know, you shouldn't mm -hmm. let that stop. You can do it at any time. There's some great comments coming in. Yeah, and we, we talked last week around when we did our uh, building and investment building support this is where that comes mm -hmm. from. This is the, those allies that you're building in the organization. Those yeah. people that believe in you and support you, you believe in them and support them. Um, all those happen. So yeah, here we go. Uh, go on, Rachel, speak it. Bring your own seat and table. Absolutely. Uh, let's see who else we got here. Uh, from Stacy, can we create the table if you know there's somewhere you need to be? I mean, that's that's part of it. Or, or do we start to define Definitely. those conversations? Um, out there and yes you could always make a logo out of my <laughs> furniture thing. now challenge accepted out there uh, all right let's go to our oh that must be our anonymous user must be sonia out there so good i think it's like, Alyssa. Oh. I, th I think it's Alyssa. she, she oh, we said have, I, we I, have, earlier we might have two we might have two different anonymous people out there anyway okay let's make this happen let's bring up okay so the last one we've got here is Fake HR and other conversations. This was my contribution. Mm -hmm. This is this is where this comes from. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. I love I love LinkedIn. Anybody who sees me out there, I publish a lot of content, share a lot of content, comment on content. Absolutely love it. I see this thing happening amongst HR leaders, Rachel. That it truly might be a real syndrome, like a mm -hmm. medically diagnosed syndrome where they are sharing fake HR conversations to prove a point. And I'll give you an mm -hmm. example. There's an HR leader out there. I'll, let's call her Bridget because that's her first name. <laughs> that posts these conversations where it'll be a, one time uh, an employee asked off time for work. And then I said, sure. And they said, don't you want to know why? And I said, no, because I trust you. These conversations don't happen. Why are we framing these updated, these LinkedIn posts to prove a point out there? Mm. It, it just gets me, it gets me, because so many great stories out there, we don't need to invent these fake ones because my point, and I commented on her post about this because I couldn't let it go. Of course. What, what, let's, let's pretend this conversation really happened. Let's pretend. Mm -hmm. What if an employee was excited about something? Maybe they were taking the day off because they were adopting a dog. Maybe they were taking it off because a family member was having a child and they wanted to talk about it. But instead, this boss was like, no, you don't need to tell me. I trust you. Like, no, that's these things. I don't know how conversations work. But along those lines, you know, I've also ranted uh, about this before on LinkedIn and, and Dan just commented, their HR director is Bridget. Dan, I don't think it's her. Um, that people will say, uh, people always ask me dot, 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 insert, insert item. That I that, never that, ask them. That, that people want to just talk about. They want to talk about it, but they can't, they don't have the, they feel like they have to say, well, other people want to hear it. These fake people out mm -hmm. there, the president of the United States does this all the time. That people, oh, always, not there. people always say. People always ask me, nobody's, no, just if you have a point to yeah, share, just share sometimes it. Sometimes they might. Sometimes they might. Sometimes, playing devil's advocate, oh, like a little, a little bit, like a little bit. <laughs> That's a screen grab we're going to use from this show. 
<laughs> you hear me going like that. Um, but I, I, I tagged you yesterday. I screenshotted one, didn't I, yesterday? I sent yeah. it to you. I saw a, such a classic example. And it was LinkedIn. And it was such a fake HR post. It was exactly that. And it was to make the poster look poster. Yeah. Um, look good, really. And it, it was kind of a nonsense story. But the key is there, search it. So look at the phrases they're using and then search it in LinkedIn. You will find the same story surfacing over yes. and over again with a name change all the time. So do yeah. that. If you've never done that, do that because it's, it's fun. Drives me crazy when I see that stuff out there, that people responding as if it's original content. We know that it's not. And let alone if it's even repeated mm -hmm. so many times, time and time and time again out there. It really irks you, doesn't it? it? Well, because it's not original. I like... I like original stories. There's so much real stuff happening out there. We don't need to create fake conversations between employees that one, I don't think tell a very good narrative from a manager standpoint, let alone from an HR leader. Good stories. They're yeah, not they're even good stories. Good, they? No, not even good stories. So we're, I think we're on the final topic. Have we, have we done seven? Did Maybe. we do I think seven? We yeah, I think, we, I think we've covered all of our grievances. Nailed it. Oh, we've done all of it. The, yeah, um, good work. Yep. The, there was one in here. There's one in the chat. I'm not going to find it. Man, I th it was a good one that somebody threw in. And the conversation and the thread has been so good. I apologize if I, if I don't end up finding it. But um, yeah, thanks everybody for, for the participation on the show. I do want to learn a little more about your shirt, though, that you're wearing today, Rachel. So this is, I've got two versions, two similar ones. I've got one which is a, a rainbow, which is thank you, which is NHS, which is raising money for our National Health Service. Um, and this one is from Pickle London, and it's raising money for Mind, which is their mental health charity. So obviously rainbows are being used globally as a symbol of hope at the moment to get us through the pandemic. So this is part of my, I have rainbows in my in my house. We Lots of people have rainbows in their houses to thank the NHS, the National Health Service here as well. So it's part of my, contribution to support people who are doing, yep. doing a good job. And that and that was very much some of the thinking behind the logo creation, Rachel, of Spin the Wheel. Don't try with that, that with me, Jack. Image what was it? In there. What was it? Not and it. today I am sporting my Black Lives Matter <laughs> shirt. Uh, because that, that is a conversation that you and I've had on a few different episodes here that I want all mm -hmm. of us to continue having that conversation. Uh, but to-, to I love Katrina's up, episode. Oh, so I, episode I four. Be a part of it. Episode four. Yeah. yeah. Well, I enjoyed episode four. Chuck had tech problems and was I, just I enjoyed coming, watching coming in and it. out. I enjoyed watching it after the fact. Um, but anyway, let's wrap this up. We've gone over. I knew we would. It's the right thing to do for a season finale out here. There is no cliffhanger. There is no who shot JR for any 80s kids out there. Uh, <laughs> but we promise we will come back with something new, something original, something fun to do uh, with this. So I want to I want to wrap up with some some thank yous out there. Uh, first off, Rachel, thank you for agreeing to do this with me. Uh, I have Pleasure. again for people that work with me, I throw out a lot of ideas. Some are very good, some are not so good. Um, I think this was one of the good ones. This is a fun thing to do for a couple of weeks. Our goal was to create some different conversations out there in this internal comms industry that we're in and have some fun along the way during some very tough times uh, for us. So thank you, Rachel, for being a part of that. I want to thank Kristen Pleasure. Hancock, uh, my wife, for being an executive producer, uh, helping me figure out this live stream. And we had some hiccups along the way, but we finally figured it out uh, weeks later uh, to make this all happen. So thank you, and Ian, happy Canada Day to our Canadians out there. Uh, thank you to Social Chorus for supporting this. Um, again, agreeing to help support this idea. Again, I've worked there for close to three years now uh, between this and the Culture Comms and Cocktails podcast. We're always looking for great ways to have conversations with the comms world. And then perhaps most importantly, I want to thank all of you who have joined either this show, past shows, watched replays, catching it up, have given Rachel and I feedback during it. This is why we've invested this time is to create this community especially when so much of our world has been interrupted by the normal things as an industry we would do, get together for events, whether it be IABC World Conference, uh, PRC Connect, those are two that are involved. And I know uh, you had your own event in London, Rachel, that has now been rescheduled. Yeah, the Big Yak. Yeah, the Big Yak, absolutely. The is now February. 
Yeah. So so that is so we wanted to come up with ways to bring this community together. Hopefully this this certainly feels that way to me. Um, I self describe myself as an internal comms cheerleader, not an expert. I'm an enthusiast out there. Uh, so thanks everybody for for being a part of this. All the conversation has been wonderful. It has. It's been great fun. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. If you've missed any of the shows, they're on the Social Chorus YouTube channel. So feel free to catch up and you can always um, get in touch with Chuck or I online if you have any comments or suggestions. And the show will go on online. We will continue the conversations online. But it's been great to unite the community globally. That was the whole intention to have a bit of fun through this time. And because we're working super hard and, and I always say at the end of the show, keep going. You're working really hard look after yourself look after each other and that's my parting message really from the end of the the show is thank you it's been a pleasure and let's continue having the conversations now i'm dating myself here a little bit there was an old game show rachel that i felt and somebody come in the chat where they would they would end it with like a big like blowing a they'd blow a kiss maybe this was an american oh, I don't thing. Know. but anyway maybe. thank you internal comms all for being <laughs> a part of this uh have a great summer we'll be back with season two we'll see what it looks like uh, but until then, everybody take care of yourself. Thanks all. Bye.